This episode was recorded starting January 6, 2021, following some production issues. Hence, some of the material will be out of date and took us a little while longer than expected to edit together. Welcome to the Gallimorphic Science Podcast, a podcast about science, art, and culture. My name is Tommy, and joining me are my co-hosts, Scott, Raven, and Zach. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Scott, and I'm a co-host of the Gallimorphic Science Podcast. Hello, I am Raven. I am also a co-host of the Gallimorphic Science Podcast. Hi, I'm Zach. I'm also what they said. <laughs> so, so it's been a while since our last podcast. Uh, you know, Christmas has gone by, New Year's has gone by. We are in 2021. Uh, what's everyone been up to between now and then? Well, I'll go first, if uh, that's okay. Um, yep. Basically, I've been working on a painting that I started back in 2017, I think, of a Desmostylian. And I am on the verge of finishing that painting up. And I've been working, I've been plugging on it pretty hard now so for the past couple of weeks. But most especially between now and the last podcast, I've been putting a lot of my time and energy and effort into that. I guess I'll go next. So I don't know if any of you remember, but last time I mentioned that I was chosen to speak at a international science conference called the Tet Zoom Con. This year it was called Tet Zoom Con, of course, because we had to do it over Zoom. But I believe uh, it's been going on for a long time now and put on by Dr. Darren Nash. And I got to talk about color theory to some paleo artists up in Cummings. So Went over well. I felt like I kind of choked a couple times, but uh, uh, everybody seemed to enjoy themselves, and really, that's what this kind of thing is all about. And uh, all fun, fun was had by all into the wee hours of the morning, and then into the next afternoon. Apparently, there were some diehard people that were on until like one p.m., so a full twenty-four hours had elapsed, and these people were were still partying hard. You know, solidarity to them, and uh, I wish I had that kind of energy anymore. But uh, that went well, and. I uh, also got some artwork on my plate here that I've been working on for Rebecca Hunt Foster. She has commissioned me to do some stuff for Girl Scouts of Utah. I'm designing some patches for them. So I'm really excited about that because patch design is something I've always wanted to get into. So this is uh, broadening my horizons a bit and also kind of like, hey, I get to do something new and something I've kind of wanted to do for a while. So it'll be interesting because I'm working with a very limited color palette, only like four colors maximum. It's uh, kind of an exercise in, in both color theory and tricking the eye to see colors that aren't there. Because you can do some things with, you know, threads and all and all that. You just tend to run up the budget a bit if you use additional colors. But you, So I might have to do some research on how to make one color look like another by placing it next to another, which you can see explained in detail in a book called Color and Light by James Gurney, an artist that I think some of us are familiar with. Most famously, he worked on this book series called Dinotopia, starting in the 1980s. Heard of it? Yep, yep. I own a very large print of that. Actually, I got my print of the dinosaurs on parade in 1988 when it Ooh, came out. Nice. That thing has been on my wall in one form or another for literally 30 years. A lot of people may not know this, but James Gurney he also worked on a little thing called Fire and Ice, which was a Frank Frazetta animated film with, I think it was uh, Rolf Bakshi. Really? Yes, back in that the early 80s. Him and Thomas Kincaid actually worked together as background painters on this uh, animated film. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, you'll love it. Uh, I'm surprised you haven't heard of this, Zach, because it's right up your alley. It's got... It's got buxom women in loincloths. It's got ugly Neanderthal men. It's got uh, pterosaurs you can ride on. Oh, my God. Advancing glaciers. Yeah, it's actually kind of one of, I think, Bakshi's better films. Like, everybody knows Bakshi for Wizards, but they don't know that Bakshi also did this fire and ice thing, uh, at least not that I've run into. Oh, my gosh. Look at this thing. You could actually pause on some of these scenes and just like get lost in the backgrounds of of masters of landscape painting, Thomas Kincaid and, and James Gurney. How have I not been aware of this? This looks like amazing. It is actually pretty amazing. It's just it's not that well written and it's got Death Dealer in a various form. Huh. Well, I mean, look, merely by existing, this is better than Wizards. 
right? <laughs> yes. Okay. I mean, I love Wizards, but Wizards is not a good movie by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, no. Oh, no. I agree with you there. Wow. This is great. Uh, don't be expecting like an Oscar winning animated film here either. Just just to let you know. I mean, look, it's it's boxy. It's boxy, but it is so freaking enjoyable watching that movie. So oh. um, I, I've kind of veered off on, off topic here. No, that's fine. I'm glad you did. Wow. But uh, yeah, that's what I basically I've been up to. I've apparently blowing Zach's mind here with some uh, animated cartoon trivia and working on some stuff for Rebecca Hunt Foster. And I gave a pretty awesome talk, I think. Anyway, uh, yeah, that was that's basically what I've been up to. So, Zach, on to you. What's your news from the world of Zach? I guess we had Christmas and we had New Year. Um, I, I have not been up to much S since we talked last time. I've been talking about revising my Pokemon phylogeny for PAX South. Well, PAX South was canceled outright. I mean, no no Zoom PAX South either. There was a, a Zoom PAX East. but So I figured they'd do Zoom PAX South, but they did not. It's just gone. So I'm not doing the Pokemon phylogeny this year, which is probably fine. I've just been drawing a lot. Not much else. I got an Xbox Series X, and I've been playing the games I already have on it with no load times, which is wonderful. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. Really nice. You'd be surprised what a difference that makes. But um, yeah, just video games and drawing. Hey, you know, living the dream, man. Yeah. <laughs> living the dream right there. Yeah. And that's it for me. Well, um, in the meantime, between our last recording and now, uh, I have a new post over at the Parasite of the Day. Uh, this one's actually about a fungus, also known as the caterpillar fungus, Ophiocordyceps sinensis. So this particular fungus is found on the Tibetan plateau, on the highlands of Tibet. And it's traditionally known as uh, an ingredient in Chinese medicine, where it's known as Dongchong Sha Chao. So this particular fungus has been known for literally centuries. But despite those many studies looking at the potential medicinal property or the pharmaceutical property of this fungus, uh, there's actually very little known about its natural ecology. And it seems to have a life cycle that is a little bit different to that of their other relatives, like the so-called zombie ant fungus. So if anyone wants to check it out, you can check it out in the show notes and head over to the Parasite of the Day blog. The other thing that happened, well, I guess the fall 2020 anime season wrapped up. And it turns out that out of the four picks that I picked in episode two, three of them turned out to be really good. Golden Kamui just keep on upping its ante and upping its game. There are moments there where it goes from like extreme tension to extreme violence to extreme hilarity within the space of like 10 minutes. It's like a scene that would start off with a tense standoff between two of the characters ends up with one of the other characters pissing on the other character's face. And I won't go into how oh, that okay. actually oh. You should probably watch that for yourself. Um, Sleepy Princess is uh, fantastic, and I think that the script writer and the director for that show should also get maybe season two for that show, because they also did another show that I found quite funny called Monthly Girl Nozaki-kun. And that seems to be a curse at Doga Kobo, the studio that produced the show, where they make a really, really good anime comedy, and they never make a second season. Instead, they make a second season of some bullshit like Uza Maid or some other fucking shit that I hate. The other show that I picked was uh, Akadama Drive, which is probably the most cyberpunk thing to have cyberpunked this year. It's uh, spectacular all the way to the end. And even though at the start, I was like, well, I'm willing to just watch it just for the spectacle. I don't care if there's actually a central message. It does turn out to have a central theme and central message. And the central message appears to be, uh, fuck the police and all cops are bars. <laughs> Yes. So uh, that was fantastic. Wondering which continued to look really good throughout the entire way. Like even in the last episode, there was like a massive fight scene that looked really, really nice. Unfortunately, the writing is really quite not good. Um, the right, like it, it, they try to, the writer tried to delve into all these like heady topics and it, seems that the writer doesn't have the level of maturity or understanding to tackle them properly. I think there was one episode that involves time travel and of all things, um, this is a spoiler, but like a murder child, as in a child that goes around murdering people. And judging from the tone of the episode that was supposed to 
kind of shock me and makes me go, oh God, the grim dark world. Uh, but I just, it just made me laugh because it was trying so hard and it doesn't have the level of maturity to pull it off. So it ended up being really, really ridiculous. So I would say Wandering Witch is kind of like the main character's leading protagonist in that like, oh, it's pretty to look at, but it's very kind of like vacuous in like very shitty, kind of very shallow kind of a personality to the show. So um, out of the three, at the end of the season, the three that I will still continue to recommend to everyone is catch up on Golden Camry, go and watch Sleepy Princess because that show would be really, really good if you're in lockdown and want to feel comfy and laugh at the same time. And also Akadama Drive because, well, all cops are bastard. So that's kind of what I've been up to in the meantime. I also read a bunch of books, uh, read a really interesting book about the Blackbird or the SR-71 and all the development that lead up to this legendary aircraft that is probably one of the most recognizable aircraft in the world. But without going off on a tangent, I'll leave that to some other time. Also got a book about Ikrano plans and all things. Uh, so going through that right now. With that out of the way, uh, let's get started on some of the papers and science stuff we've been reading leading up to this podcast. So I picked Spider Traps Amphibian in Northeast Madagascar for my paper because it was really short. Plus, it's really, really fascinating hearing about invertebrates preying on vertebrate animals. It's by, I hope I pronounced this correctly, by Fulgens et al. And basically... It's a very short paper, and the only thing that's really discussed is how spiders are preying on small frogs by building traps called retreats. They're just large enough to contain their prey, and the retreats serve as shade, so frogs will be attracted to the cover during the hottest part of the day. And then the spiders eat the frogs, and that's, that's basically the entire paper right there. But going along with that, we have another paper, Arthropods as Vertebrate Predators, A Review of Global Patterns by Jose Valdez. And this is a review of the literature of, well, basically what it says, arthropods as a vertebrate predator. So there is a ton of information in here. So for those who are listening at home who want to kind of picture how these traps actually look like, it's actually relatively simple. So the spiders just get kind of two leaves that are adjacent to each other, and they use the silk to tie or bind the tip of the leaves together. So it's kind of almost this like, I don't know, taco shape thing. <laughs> would you say that's correct? Like, yeah, it's like this little pocket. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah, little pocket or a little envelope that the frog goes, oh, it's getting a bit hot. I'm gonna go in there. And then spider goes like, oh, lunch is delivered. Lunch is delivered and then they has lunch, yeah. <laughs> that's rather incredible if you think about it. Well, yeah, yeah, but there's been like lots and lots of examples of cases where invertebrates prey on vertebrate yeah. animals. And frogs are especially susceptible. Yeah. Because they have very, very thin skins, in spite of all their other, their other attributes, like their ability to escape from predators, or jump really fast, or, or excrete toxins, or just be toxic, you know, that, uh, that thin skin makes them susceptible to, you know, some of the larger arthropod predators. I guess the other thing about them is that there's just a lot of them. There's like many variety of, of them. So there's, uh, if, if a vertebrate were to be caught by an arthropod, just on a probability thing, it would be likely to be a frog, just simply because there's so many different types of frogs that are around. Up to 40%, according to this other paper. I have a paper in my drive by Von May et al. called Ecological Interactions Between Arthropods and Small Vertebrates in the Lowland Amazon Rainforest. And there are just a ton of high-quality pictures of spiders eating all sorts of stuff, like frogs, Ooh, yeah. fish. Yeah. Here's a gecko. Uh, oh, there's yeah. a snake. <laughs> mice. It was pointed out in this particular review paper that about half of the events that were recorded in the literature were of spiders. And the author suggested that might be because there is a wide variety of spiders and they engage in a wide variety of hunting techniques ranging from webs, like giant orb webs that catch things in midair to, you know, some spiders that are semi-aquatic, they catch aquatic things, ambush predators. They just have all kinds of hunting strategy, and so they end up catching all kinds of different vertebrate animals as well. Yeah. Because if you're small enough, a spider would go for you, because why not? 
In this paper, there is one really interesting thing. There's this gigantic tarantula that every time it almost eats this one little kind of frog, it doesn't because the frog eats fly larvae that have been laid on the tarantula. Yeah, tarantulas, there is a type of fly that specialized on basically doing the whole xenomorph thing on tarantulas. They lay eggs in the fly body and, yeah, and then cat and everything. So yeah, that's that's nuts. But spiders eat everything. And we shouldn't be surprised at this. I mean, you all saw eight-legged freaks. Spiders will eat just about anything they can catch, <laughs> even people. Yes, that great documentary, Eight-Legged Freaks. About <laughs> I like that movie. <laughs> it was a good movie. So there is also other interesting patterns in the paper uh, that got caught up in this particular review, which was the pattern of uh, publication. So most of the studies were from the US, Brazil, and Australia, which is not because those places are more likely to have spiders and arthropods preying on vertebrate. It more betrays a bias in the scientific communities and the kind of studies that are being conducted around the world and who have access to resources to do those research. Right. So that's a warning that was in the back of the paper basically caution is advised when interpreting these results since the frequency or patterns recorded in the literature may not be representative of what occurs in nature uh, if anything it probably happened more often because the author did also say a lot of these things happen in the dark and at night when people aren't, aren't watching so it's quite likely that spiders and centipedes and all kinds of creepy crawly critters out there are eating small vertebrate animals and we're not even seeing them yeah i'm sure that's true got a ton of great facts just crammed in here for your perusal really we'll definitely have a link in the show notes if it's available for public access it's not just spiders that go after vertebrates. The number one invertebrate predators of birds are praying mantises. Really? Ants and praying mantis. Yeah, those are the two that stood out. Oh. I found this uh, the whole thing fascinating because, of course, I knew about bird spiders that, that you would, would catch fish or birds, you know, in a web or, or something like that. But nothing more specific than that. I was about to laugh there because you said bird spiders that catch fish. <laughs> poorly named spiders that catch fish you know they're invertebrates they're they do what they do i'm certain they'll, they'll go after just about anything i mean yeah. and one big question i have about all this is mm -hmm. uh th this doesn't seem to talk about marine predation or anything like that this is just stuff that happened on land for the most part with the exception yeah. of like water bugs right i think this particular author kind of limit the scope to that because in the marine environment, you'll have a lot more example. Oh, wait, hang on. They did mention crabs. Yeah, they did mention crabs eating turtles and stuff. One thing about the marine environment is that a lot of the stuff happens down there that is out of sight. Definitely, there are arthropods that are preying on vertebrate animals. You know, you have stomatopods and all kinds of things that would be preying on vertebrate animals that are marine arthropods. But I can't recall whether that's like either outside the scope of the paper or it's just more difficult to record that kinds of things because you need like scuba gear and that kind of stuff to observe. And also they specify that all the studies are kind of wild observations as opposed to like lab setup. It's difficult to observe things out in the sea. Crabs and other decapod predators were observed to prey equally on reptiles, birds, and amphibian, apparently, according to this paper. But they didn't form like a big part of the literature. And so it's possible that this paper didn't report many of the marine examples of arthropod preying on vertebrate prey, which you would think it would. But maybe there are just aren't as much of that in the literature, or maybe the paper just want to focus on mostly terrestrial and freshwater examples. So even the decapod mentioned there, I don't know if they're like land crabs or whatever, I'll have to go literally digging through all the papers to find out. And I didn't have time. I don't have time to go digging through someone else's papers and stuff like that. <laughs> no, I, I, I get you. I get you. That, that was supposed to be my job. I had one job. <laughs> well, it is quite a lot. It is uh, overwhelming, really. 
Yeah, there was another interesting thing that I noticed is that about one third of the events, the author kind of grabbed those particular reports from other reviews, and this kind of really shows the value of like review papers. When I talk to people who aren't in science and academia, they go like, "Oh, you know, what's the point of like writing about other people's stuff? You're just basically." Reading a whole bunch of other people's stuff and writing about it, but this particular thematic review demonstrates the value of having these reviews, which is like, well, you individually yourself going out and reading all this literature, you have to look for them, and then you have to like find them, and you have to read through them and stuff like that. Having a review paper is actually really, really useful because it compiles them all in one place and put them in context of each other. So, for this particular systematic review, the author said that about one third of the events were actually collected from this one particular journal called Herpetological Reviews. As someone who had written review paper, I guess this is just more from like me, it's like defending the value of writing review papers. Even though I am writing about other people's work, but it kind of gets all of that stuff together and go, okay, here it is in context of all the other similar phenomena. Yeah, I get a lot of value out of review papers because then I don't have to, you know, read every paper that's ever been published on a given topic. I can、yeah. read this handy review paper and see what the state of research is on X topic. Yeah, it's really good for like, okay, you know, if you're new to a field or you're unfamiliar with field, this is kind of like, okay, here's a little quick intro to get familiarize you with the relevant literature and all that kind of stuff.、Mm -hmm. How would somebody go about finding a review paper in the first place?、Uh, finding a review paper or like. Writing a review paper. Finding a review paper. Say, like somebody is getting into the field and they want to、uh, learn about nematodes. How would they go about searching for one? There are certain journals that specialize in reviews. So, for example,、uh, biological reviews, as the journal title indicates, they only publish long review. I have a paper in biological reviews about fossil parasites. There's a few other journals that are like trends. They they all title as、uh, trends in. So trends in ecology and evolution, trends in parasitology, and they're all kind of like those are short, punchy reviews that give you like a very quick one on one on like okay, here's the current state of the field on this particular topic, and they're usually pretty short, like about five to seven pages. Biological review is the one where you want to read like long monographs that are like twenty to fifty pages long, just going over everything possible about a particular topic. So there are certain journals that specialize in publishing review, and、uh, I would say maybe like whatever you're interested in, nematodes or like hummingbirds, and then just look up hummingbird and review in Google Scholar, and you might turn up like a review paper about that kind of、yeah. stuff. So. Um, there are certain journals that specialize in publishing only reviews, but not only those journals. There are some other journals that usually publish research papers, but every now and then they'll get a review paper and go, "Oh, this is pretty good. We'll publish that." You also sometimes get a, a review paper that's, you know, ostensibly a paper about a new taxon, but because the field or the I'm thinking about specifically drapanosaurs, there was a big A monograph about drapanosaurs that named a couple new species of drapanosaurs, but also reviewed all the you know literature up until that point. I want to say it was from two thousand, two thousand one in New Mexico's Museum Journal. But I, I've found many review papers that are primarily about naming a new taxon, but they're like, while we're here, here's what all the research is set up to now. Yeah, sometimes when you have a field, let's say a particular group that haven't been studied for like a long time, I guess the authors want to get everyone up to speed on like, okay, no one's published anything on this particular group or this particular topic for like forty years. Let me get you up to speed on all these like previously published papers because those papers might be in journals that might not even be accessible by you know electronic means or whatever、True. other means. Anything else to add on to Scott's paper about trap setting arthropods? Well,、uh, the only one other thing I would add is that the family of spider that set the trap—it's、uh, in the huntsman spider—and they're actually relatively common, at least 
here in Australia, I had like one or two huntsmen that was hanging around in my house for a while. Uh, I kind of took them outside because I was worried that I might not get any food. But otherwise, I would have been happy to have them around crawling in my house. You weren't, you weren't worried they'd kill you? Because everything on Australia is trying to kill you, right? <laughs> well, allegedly. <laughs> but like, I haven't been killed by any native Australian animal yet. So uh, I, I feel like I'm going to be safe. Well, that's good. That's good. I I make peace with the native animals. There you go. Yes. All right. I let Scott transplant them into the house plants. And oh, speaking of plants, I'd like to uh, seg into my paper, or actually, it's not really a paper as much as it's just some news articles I came across here. Japan right now is looking at creating wooden satellites. December 30th, 2020 on Popular Mechanics is where I'm getting some of my information from. Kyoto University has formed uh, basically their own little company called Sumimoto Forestry to facilitate this study and research. Sumimoto Forestry, the reason they want to build a wooden satellite is they believe that that'll help with the space junk problem. In that satellites, when you deorbit them, will burn up in the atmosphere, but wooden ones will burn up more completely. And the other thing about traditional satellites is there's a lot of metals like aluminum that make up their construction. That was the other thing that was covered in the press release for Sumimoto Forestry was the fact that we don't know the effects on the atmosphere with all this aluminum particles floating around kind of high up because that's where things burn up is high up in the atmosphere. Probably not great, though. It's probably not great for the for the atmosphere or for the environment at large. You're, yeah, correct. To keep doing the things that we're doing. So it's not going to per se stop the space junk problem because you're going to launch the satellite and it's going to be a wooden satellite in space. You still have a satellite in space. You still have the junk up there. But I think what they're actually trying to say here is when we finally get to the point where we can deorbit these things regularly and safely with other satellites, it would probably behoove us to not have chunks of metal and metal gas as we deorbit all 15,000 pieces of detritus that are floating around right now in orbit around Earth. For those of you who may not know, there are over 15,000 man-made objects right now in orbit around our planet, and thousands more are going to be added this year and uh, the next year thanks to uh, SpaceX and their satellite constellations that they're putting up the little mini-sats. The problem isn't with the satellites themselves, the things that we use for communications. It's the things that we use to get them up there, the boosters, the shells that we use to protect them. Those objects are more numerous than satellites themselves. I think it's kind of fascinating myself that they're building these wooden satellites, even if it doesn't really solve the space junk problem, because now you've got, instead of something that's made of like, you know, a thin layer of metal or carbon fiber, now you've got something that's made of wood and that's significantly more massive, if you will, than something same size made of metal. But I think we can get around some of that by, even with modern uh, material technology involving wood, because wood is a very... First of all, it's a very versatile, tough thing. It's made of two polymers, actually. The one, first one we all know is cellulose, and the second one is lingon. But lingon is the stuff that we don't want when it comes to trying to make something that can withstand things like metal can. So lingon is hard to compress. It's hard to break down. You want to get rid of that. And the way that I think that they could do that is using this new method that was talked about in 2019. It's called a radiative cooling structural material. And it's supposed to be something that can replace concrete eventually. Ooh. It's basically wood that has been boiled for a while in hydrogen peroxide, basically. High concentration hydrogen peroxide. And what that does is it boils away the lignin, and all you're left is cellulose nanofibers, which can be then compressed into something that's, uh, I'd say, a third of the thickness and still has all of the structural integrity of wood plus some because you've gotten rid of the softer stuff, the lignin. Conversely, harder to uh, deal with as far as a building material. Oh, yeah. They do that when they make paper as well, getting rid of the lignin. It kind of messes with the paper. So, yeah, this is like an industrial process that is also applicable to 
I guess when you use wood for other products like paper, for example. The cool thing about this treated wood in this description here of radiated cooling structural material, I'll be sure to include this paper also in the podcast notes. It has a tendency to be really reflective as far as heat. And when you have infrared bouncing around inside of this nanofiber after you've treated it, these nanofibers reflect heat back in a wavelength that is actually invisible to our atmosphere. Heat reflected back is in a wavelength that literally just radiates out into space, which I thought was really fascinating because, you know, at first I was thinking, okay, how are they going to do this? Are they going to layer smaller amounts of metal onto these wooden satellites to then reflect heat if you have heat sensitive things? But as it turns out, you may not have to with these kind of material sciences that are going on here with this. And it's, I thought it was really great because you're taking something that I have a fondness for woodworking. And then you're bringing it into the 21st century with material science using things that you can basically find around the house. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure there's more to it than just boiling a piece of wood and hydrogen peroxide. But anyway, some of the strength as well that they're able to get out of this is pretty interesting. They are actually thinking about using this as a way to replace steel and concrete because of how much weight it can handle. Wow. Uh, wood engineering feet. So yeah, that could be something that they use to make these new satellites with. Cut down on mass a little bit. And plus, it naturally reflects heat into space. So why not? If it ignores our atmosphere, then it will be just fine in a vacuum, I think. I could be wrong. They call this new material cooling wood. Have they have they considered making satellites out of log? <laughs> because it's thick, it's heavy, it's wood, right? Yeah, right. exactly. There seems to be, I guess, a move, and this has been coming for like the last few decades towards using biological material for all kinds of usual building material stuff, simply because biological material have certain advantages that are over usual synthetic materials. So for example, in parallel with this, I was thinking about all those uh, studies investigating using fungi to replace or supplement concrete. What? So... Yeah, they, they try to make, I guess you could call them self-healing concrete. So using like fungus, because many of these fungus, they can have thick hypho masses that can grow these structures and stuff like that. So they're looking into incorporating fungi into concrete mix or even just as a substitute. So placing fungal spore into nutrients in the concrete matrix so that if there's a crack, the fungi would just like growing across it. Wow. Yeah. So using biological material, because biological material can do stuff like this. And many biological materials, such as lignin, they were, I guess you could call them almost like the original plastic. When lignin was first originally evolved, there were very few things that were able to break it down because it's like, oh, what's this? We've never tried to digest this biological polymer before. Very quickly, there were various things such as like microbes and fungi that have evolved to then break down wood. But for a very short period of time in geological history, wood was almost kind of like the plastic of its day. I guess one of the case for using wood is being able to use that instead of more, I guess in a war setting, they're called strategic material. Right. So just like various metals and stuff like that. So it would put less pressure on that kind of material, if you could grow the material that I use for building satellites, that might exactly. that also has its own problems, but at least it offsets the a demand on various kind of metal that might be needed for building other kinds of infrastructures. Right. And with this new material science is coming out, especially with this cooling wood technology, I will have to look. I don't know what kind of wood they use for this, if it was a hardwood. And I don't actually think they really went into quite that much detail about what kind of wood they were using. So there is a, a chance of using a fast growing softwood for this kind of thing too. So like something that grows fast, like a cottonwood or something could be used. You know, we see that as a trash tree. They're, they're really not. Yeah. They just are trashy uh, <laughs> during certain times of year. But because at first I was thinking, oh man, are they going to have to like clear old growth forests or something for, for doing this? Japanese forestry is done quite a bit differently from what I've seen. Now, this could be just like this particular company that does it. But a lot of times what they do is they'll 
do bonsai writ large. I've seen photos where they have like this giant gnarled, like hundreds and hundreds of year old trunk of a tree. And that part is like maybe 10 or 20 foot tall, but growing up out of this trunk are 10 smaller trees straight up in the air. Yeah, this thing grows branches that become trees, basically. So they, instead of clear cutting a forest, what they do is they train these certain trees to grow smaller versions of itself just like they do with bonsai. Big bonsai. Big bonsais. And uh, I'll be sure to include some links to that too, because it's kind of an interesting thing to see. I'll be really interested to see some of the schematics for these satellites once they start making them, because I don't know if you have ever looked at Japanese woodworking, but it's beautiful. A lot of the joinery that they do is done without like metal tools, other than, you know, of course, cutting the wood. They don't do things like nails. They do wooden pegs instead that fit in and lock everything in place. That's cool. It is really cool. So like once the peg is pounded in, it all becomes flush and you can't tell or you have a hard time telling. And then it's like actually kind of easy to disassemble, too, because you just knock out the peg and then slide the wood in a certain way and then you can take it apart. So like before they invented screws, that's how you made something that you could build and then break back down if you needed to. Or if something untoward happened, it would be not too hard to be able to chisel something else out and then slide that back into place. And and, uh, some of their forestry techniques are interesting, especially because they have to be able to maintain forests on a a small island. It's a a great idea. I I think that they should do this, but it's not really going to solve the space junk problem. And this, you're still dealing with something a little more massive than a normal traditional satellite. So there are going to be problems there with like potential collisions. Those collisions will become a little more violent and a little harder. But uh, overall, I think we should do it anyway. It's, you know, the the benefits kind of outweigh some of the, the bad things, I think. And I think it's a good idea. Go Japan. Keep going at it. Wonderful. Excellent. Next. Okay, so I came across this paper in a journal called like a well-known ecological journal called Ecology. Uh, It was published about a year ago and it was an observation that was made uh, and some samples were collected as well by some uh, deep sea submersibles. So these scientists use some remotely controlled deep sea uh, submersible to go down at the Costa Rican slope down to about 1,800 to 1,900 meters below sea level. And what they found there were these things called xenophyophoria. Uh, So just as a bit of a context, xenophyophoria are these really unusual group of deep sea protists, I guess you could use that term. Uh, Basically, among scientists, protists is just a term that is this really archaic term that came from like, you know, last century and it's basically these are eukaryote things that are single cell we don't know where to put them so we've got to throw them into this group called protists but there's a wide variety of them and these guys uh you know despite the fact that they're single cell they grow these massive shells called a test so the xenophyrophoria are a group of foraminiferans. And foraminiferans are these single cell things that are very common in the ocean. They're found all the way from near the shallow water all the way down to the deep sea as with those guys that grow really, really large. Uh, And they're most well recognized for growing these kind of shells around themselves that is usually formed from calcium carbonate. And so they aggregate calcium carbonate as well as sediment particle around themselves Most of them grow these little shells that reach usually about a millimeter wide. So they're usually tiny little things. You, if you come across them, you might mistaken them for like tiny sand sand grains or something like that. But these one that grows down in the deep sea, they grow this shell up to about the size of like an orange. Uh, It reach up to about 20 centimeters or eight inches in diameter. Uh, And it's all kind of really convoluted. It looks almost kind of like a brain or maybe some kind of weird lichen. Um, So it's not entirely clear what they, how they actually live down there. There's been some suggestion that maybe they use those convolution to help them collect food because these foraminiferans, they're also known as uh, mixotrophs. 
So uh, autotroph is when you have an organism that produces its own food. For, so for example, we were just talking about plants. Plants are autotrophs. They make their own food via photosynthesis, uh, as opposed to heterotrophs like animals that have to eat other things. These guys, they kind of alternate between uh, autotrophic and heterotrophic, depending on what the environmental conditions are like. Uh, so it's believed that these uh, xenophyrophoria down there in the deep sea, uh, they either pick up food particles from the surrounding water. There's also been some suggestions that they use those convolution in the shell to farm bacteria. So they have bacteria growing there that they farm and every now and then they'll collect some of the bacteria um, that are there. So some kind of unique ecology happening down there in the deep sea. Uh, but what these particular researchers found when they looked at and collected some samples of these deep sea protists was that they found fish eggs in among all those convolution. So something has been laying the eggs in shells of these deep sea protists. And those fish happen to be a family of fish called the snailfish or the leparidae. I'm not entirely clear why they call these things snailfish because if you go and look up Google image, they don't they don't look like snails at all. Uh, if if they were to look like anything, they look like pieces of chicken breast with eyes and fins uh, because they're deep sea fish. Uh, but they actually live in some of the uh, like habitats that are inhospitable to the majority of vertebrate animals. Uh, snailfish are found in depths of up to about 8,000 meters below sea level where no other backbone animals are able to go. So these snailfish, uh, they are kind of deep sea connoisseurs. And one of the habits that they have, these fish have some unique things going on. So for example, some species have modified their pelvic fin into kind of a suction cup, kind of like a sucker disc, and they're able to attach themselves onto other living things like crabs and such. Um, and speaking of attaching themselves to other living things, it seems that these snailfish have been laying their eggs in the shells of the xenophyrophoria. Uh, so that kind of adds to the list of things that snailfish, well, list of living things that snailfish have been recorded as laying their eggs in. So snailfish eggs have been found in sponges, in uh, octocorals, in the uh, shells of bivalves, and in some cases, even in various kind of stone crabs and snow crabs. So crab fishermen, such as the ones that are on like, you know, that, that show the most dangerous catch or something like that, um, they would be shucking these and processing these crabs. And every now and then they'll come across a crab where instead of gills, they would just come across a whole bunch of fish eggs. And that's because these snailfish have been laying their eggs in them. So they seem to have a habit of laying the eggs inside the body of living things, almost in this kind of semi-parasitic kind of way. And uh, they have a long kind of tubular ovipositor that they use to kind of stick the eggs in irritating places in other living animals down there in the deep sea. So I thought this was like kind of a really interesting ecology that's going on down there in the deep sea, completely out of sight that most people, you know, being land land dwelling tetrapods don't really think about that there's like a vibrant ecosystem happening down there with these kind of biological interactions very cool that's weird it is cool very cool Are, do you think they're targeting specific things to lay their eggs in or just this seems like an interesting place to lay my eggs yeah, that seems to be, it seems that different species of snailfish have like different preferences depending on like what they need out of the, like what they want out of it. So for yeah. example, the snailfish that lays their eggs inside crabs, that, that kind of makes sense because like crabs are basically these walking living armor. So that's a pretty safe place to put your eggs in if you could get it there. And also they lay it in the gill chamber, which constantly have a water flow. So it ensures that basically the crabs act as like surrogate babysitter for the eggs because they'll be protected, they'll be aerated, they'll be taken care of by the crabs uh, reluctantly, even if. So uh, yeah, so that's why they live, they, they tend to have this habit of like laying the eggs inside living things and perhaps 
different species of snailfish have different preference for. So for example, these ones described in the paper, there were two species that laid the eggs inside these xenophyrophoria. Um, some of them lay the eggs in sponges and octocoral. Maybe it just depends on the requirement. And instantly, there is a type of fish, uh, like freshwater fish, that have convergently evolved this kind of egg-laying habit. So the technical term for this lay egg brooding habit is called ostracophile. And that's when you have a fish laying the eggs inside the body of living things. And there's a freshwater fish called petalings that also lay the eggs inside living things. Specifically, they lay the eggs inside freshwater mussels. And they also have a similar adaptation in that they have a long ovipositor that they basically quickly squirt the eggs inside the muscles valve. And then the male comes along and just jizz over the muscles. And so the muscle kind of sucks in the sperm and the eggs and the eggs have special structures on them that allow them to stay lodged inside the gills of these muscles, no matter what they try to do. So um, kind of interesting biological interactions going on between fish and invertebrates that most people probably don't really think of. Yeah. That is fascinating. Does this affect bivalves oh, in negative ways? Yeah, it's really kind of unclear. Uh, I wrote a review paper a while ago looking at fish that have kind of s parasitic habits. And I did go over the literature in relation to the bitterlings and the freshwater mussels that they lay the eggs in because they are much easier to study than comparing with like snailfish, which are found in the deep sea. Uh, so right. it seems that the mus the muscles don't like it, basically. You know, they, <laughs> they don't like having things stuck to the gills, the structure that they use to like breathe and do all kinds of bodily function. They don't like having these eggs that are stuck there. And the bitterling seems to have adaptations for staying lodged. So for example, the fries, when they first hatch from the eggs, some species have these kind of almost ha hammerhead-like structures. So the outgrowths from the side of the head that ensure that they kind of lodge in there in between the gill filaments. So they wouldn't have evolved something like that if the muscles aren't actively trying to get rid of them. And it seems yeah. that the muscles, when they do get you know, the eggs sprayed into them, they, they don't like it. And the bitterlings have specially shaped eggs for staying lodged despite what the muscles do. So that indicates to me that there is some kind of co-evolution going on that the muscles don't like it, but they can't do anything about it because the bitterling are more well adapted party in this particular case. So maybe there's something going on down, uh, a similar thing going on down in the deep sea with the snailfish and the crabs and all the things that they lay the eggs in. Um, it's just not as well studied because it's difficult to do, you know, the kind of experiments you do with a freshwater fish as opposed to like these things that dwell in the deep sea that is only accessible through remotely operated submersibles. Yeah, right. yeah. Very interesting. But yeah, something to keep in mind. Deep sea fish laying eggs inside a body of living things. <laughs> that doesn't squick you out. Um, I'm going to be talking about a paper that was published a few weeks ago now about uh, uh, lagerpetids. Lagerpetids are small bipedal ornithodirans from the Triassic period, which have been found in North America, South America, and Madagascar. There are four named genera and six species. Lagerpeton, Lagerpeton, Chenarensis, Dromomeron romeri, Gregory and Gygus, Conganophon keeli, and Ixalerpeton polsinensis. Uh, most lagerpetids are small crow-sized animals and Kanganafon is smaller still. That said, Bale et al. 2020 reported fragmentary hind limb material from Dromeron fossils in New Mexico from an animal the size of early theropods like Soelophysis and Chindisaurus. Lagerpetids are best known for their lengthy gams and proportionately small pelves, and in fact, known from little else. Lagerpeton at least has a complete hind limb pelvis and some articulated dorsals and caudals, but all three species of Dromomeron are represented almost entirely by femora, and not all of them are complete femora. Conganophon is represented by a femur and partial maxilla. 
Thankfully, Ixalerpiton from Brazil is known from far more complete remains, which themselves await a full description. Their hind limbs are peculiar. The metatarsals are quite long, and digits three and four were the only weight-bearing toes. In fact, digit four is a bit longer than digit three. This strange configuration led Serino and Arcucci, 1993, to suggest that Lagerpetids and were saltators in the mode of gerboas and kangaroo rats. Certainly this would work for smaller animals, but the largest individuals of Dromomeron probably weren't jumping around unless they were doing it like kangaroos. Lagerpetids have constantly been found farther towards Dinosauria than Pterosauria among Ornithodirans as the earliest branching dinosauromorphs. However, Kamurer et al. 2020, in their description of Konganophon, found that if the perpetually unresolved taxon Scleromoclus was included in the analysis, both it and Lagerpetids wound up being the earliest branching pterosauromorphs. But without that animal, Lagerpetids were back to being basal dinosauromorphs. But this is not the first time that Lagerpetids and pterosaurs have been linked. Nesbitt, 2011, noted that the ankle structure of Lagerpeton is closer to Dimorphodon than dinosaurs, but that one character was overwhelmed by far more in common with dinosaurs. It turns out that Nesbitt and Kamur et al. were both onto something, though. Just a month or so ago, as Kura et al., 2020, reported far more features in common between Lagerpetids and pterosaurs, including the brain structure, a toothless dentary tip, large deltopectoral crest on the humerus, hook-shaped femur head, tricuspid teeth, a similar maxilla shape, and a prominent puboisciatic plate between the pubes and the ischia. And of course, there's still a bit of morphological gulf between Ixalerpeton and Eudimorphodon, but I'm confident that somebody will find animals that occupy that transition someday. Heck, Lagerpetids have been known since 1972. Maybe the pterosaur Archaeopteryx is already sitting in a museum waiting for somebody to notice it. Oh. Yay! Very cool. <laughs> Just for the, our listeners who aren't, say, dinosaur nerds or pterosaur nerds, um, pterosaurs are the flying reptiles that live during the Mesozoic era. So those are the kind bird. of animal that most... Yeah, that's right. So those are the animals that most people refer to as pterodactyl, even though there's right. no such thing. The pterodactyl right. is the pterodactyloid. Um, and they were the first group of vertebrates to have uh, power flight. So there's been kind of a long standing question in paleontology as to how they originated, because these guys just kind of suddenly popped up in the Triassic period and the earliest known pterosaurs were like as Zach mentioned eudimorphodons which already have like fully adapted anatomy for power yeah. flight they have wings they're already, and small bodies yeah exactly so there hasn't been any transitional form unlike say when you look at the fossil record nowadays for birds or for like whales uh there is no in between it just suddenly there are these things that's got wings and then prior to that it's just a bunch of like reptiles that are running around on the ground with long legs or climbing on trees and stuff like that so that's what makes this particular finding significant because it says like oh maybe it came from these guys but as zach mentioned um there is no, we still don't have a transitional form. We have a potential candidate of like where the pterosaur came from, but okay, yep. how, the question is still, how did it get there? Um, I noticed you mentioned that some of these guys could get to about the size of a coelophyses. So for the non-paleo and non-dinosaur nerds at home, how how big were the coelophyses? So Swellophysis is um, a late Triassic theropod from uh, New Mexico, the southwestern United States. And it's about six, seven feet long. Uh, very, very long bodied animal, um, very early theropod. But, uh, it, you know, got about as big as a person. Interesting. And they were like really big things. So that's why, you know, you mentioned like trying to imagine how these guys might have been jumping around. Yeah. If it's suggested that they were kind of, um, you know, jumping, kind of hopping bunny type animals, um, might be like a kangaroo or something. Right. Yeah. 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 Sounds like about the size of a wallaby, actually. Yeah. 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 And I do wonder if, if um, 
I don't know how much uh, has been done on lager pitted um, hopping aside from that paper in 1993 where it was hypothesized that they were hoppers. But given how little material is known for this group generally, I think lager peton is the only one with a foot and toes. It would be interesting to know how widespread that configuration is among the group. I mean, it might be that, uh, you know, there's a variety of feet and methods of getting around uh, among lager pettas, but we just need more material. It's interesting that various different types of these um, kind of dinosaur moth theropods have been floated as candidates, potential candidates for ancestors or relatives, like, basal versions of pterosaur. So for example, I remember up until a few years ago, was it a scleromoculus? That scleromoculus, little, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that little thing was kind of suggested as a potential candidate for something that is close to the ancestor of a uh, pterosaur. But I guess with this new study, they go, no, actually, these guys. Well, it's, it's funny you say that because in this uh, most recent paper, um, Scleromoclus does turn out to be a lager petted in their analysis. Oh, okay. Um, and that would make oh, sense. Okay. I mean, uh, Scleromoclus has, has often been considered kind of at the, at the root of the pterosauria or pterosauromorpha now. Yeah. But even though it's known from something like six or seven specimens, there are no bones. It's all, it's all cast fossils. Yeah. And in fact, just earlier this year, it was, um, I think it was Chris Bennett suggested that Scleromoclus was a doswellid, which is far away from pterosaurs and dinosaurs, closer to things like as dinosaurs and um, Trilophosaurus and, you know, things that are outside even the split between crocodilians and dinosaurs. Weird. There were certain uh, crocodilomorphs that were evolving kind of, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Ephigia. Uh, oh yeah, like they were so, like they were kind of almost like evolving dinosaur body yep. shapes, theropod yep. body shapes before you know theropods were even a thing. Um, yeah, and, these and were papasaurus yeah. and yes, that's and, right. Uh, papasaurus was a bipedal, big carnivorous crocodile with a uh, huge theropod-like jaws. It's crazy. I mean, crocodiles yeah. did that. Could be a whole topic for a whole podcast. We could talk about how. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've been I've been proposing that like the people who are still really butthurt about like oh dinosaurs have feathers now they don't look like they don't look like dragon me and stuff I've been proposing that they should just instead of being like dinosaur stands they just become fans <laughs> of these popasaurids because it's like there there's the scaly bipedal right. kind of like chunky dragon things that you have been looking for it's just that there they didn't go. know Wrong the family. Of Jurassic. Yeah, that's right. They're an entirely different group. Just become fans of Poposaurids instead. That's right. And let's then just Papa leave Swords the rest of us Jurassic around. World 3. <laughs> let's let's make pop like Poposaurid Park. How about that? There you go. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's even like you know, two peas. Poposaurid Park. I yeah, just like, like I'd like to see just a tri Triassic Park generally. That's where all the weirdos are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be, like, so much more fun than just your usual kind of, you know, Jurassic Park. But um, I, I have been saying on Twitter that the only way to really resurrect the Jurassic Park franchise and moving away from the whole, like, monster eating people thing is to actually make it a comedy instead, even oh, if yeah. it's a dark comedy. Yeah. Like Jurassic Park 3 is basically a comedy. <laughs> In many ways, yes. Yes, it is. It has to be. I mean, what else can yeah. it be? <laughs> well, there's a scene where they're rooting around in dinosaur shit for a satellite yeah. phone while it's going oh, on. Yeah. What else can oh, that yeah. be? More, more dinosaur shit and less dinosaur eating people. Just yeah. like, I'm, I'm just thinking of like, you know, for example, micro raptors in the trees pooping on people who are. <laughs> there you can go. have like bougie families who are visiting Jurassic Park and they have their weekend room because they got like puke, like. Microraptor poop all over them. <laughs> oh, honey. what a pretty yeah. bird! Yeah, me too. I would actually. Yes, they're like, oh, what a pretty bird! A oh, oh <laughs> yeah. shit! There goes my six hundred dollar Armani suit. Or, or somebody, uh, uh, somebody goes up to pet a jungle triceratops and gets gored. 
Yes. I, I want to see a like, for example, uh, instead of like having those scenes where a bunch of compies overwhelm and kill someone, it will be like the monkeys, like you know, monkey in like Thailand and stuff like that. Like people getting mobbed by compies oh, yeah. stealing their, because they like bright shiny things, just stealing their watches, their expensive watches, <laughs> their, their oh, devices, yeah. and things like that. That that would be far more entertaining for me if they do that in a Jurassic park film i would actually preferably watch that and you can you can kind of make it dark and maybe even like a social commentary statement let's say you know the struthiel mimers caught um some strain of bird flu from migratory bird and they had to quarantine it away and some of these like bougie types like no i came to see the struthiel mimers i want to see the struthiel mimers and then they end up like contracting some mutated strain of dido flu and there I have to go. say quarantine on the island. <laughs> that, that would be really <laughs> current. That would yeah, be. Would. Oh, you know, uh, filming it kind of like the uh, uh, District 9 style of like uh, uh, oh, docu- yeah. Yeah. getting situ Doco. documented. Yeah, documentary. Yeah, yeah. Kind so of they have like interviews of cinema, like yeah. the visitors and like interviews with the park manager and the zookeepers and stuff like that. that yeah, that would yeah. be really great. But they also kind of cut away. Uh, they use that just like as like interstitials between the scenes, I noticed. And then like when they cut away, they kind of went like to the cinema mode, which I kind of liked actually the juxtaposition of that. So uh, I think doing like the next Jurassic Park, whatever, it should be kind of like that. Because you've already kind of subverted some tropes with like uh, Camp Cretaceous just a bit too. Wow. So go whole hog. <laughs> just go whole hog. Come on, yeah, Spielberg, do it. Does Disney own the franchise? Because it seems Disney own everything. <laughs> no, I think I, I don't think so yet. I don't okay. not yet. Yeah, no, that's a that's a a Universal Studios. So yeah. it's like yeah. the the opposite of Disney World. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on whether they're willing to take risk. And in the current environment, it seems that many of these big studios are unwilling to take any yeah. risk at all. Right. Right. Now, I told Billy not to feed that duckbill dinosaur after you saw its big beak, but no, he held his hand up and had bird food in it, and that thing took his hand clean off. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And then, oh, it will be the second half of the film will actually just be like a like a, a court case. <laughs> like a thing. Going Jurassic Park. And it'll, there you yeah, go. it'll be intercutting like the court case and then you know things happening in the park and stuff like that. They'll, they'll put the really smart velociraptor on the stand as a witness. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they'll have to have Gr- uh, uh, Alan Grant back with that stupid little oh. uh, ocarina. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they communicate with it. <laughs> Yeah, so, Alan so, becomes a lawyer for the raptor or something. <laughs> advocate. That is a genius story, and we should we should have every every film studio should be beating down our door to get to it. I agree. Are we done with Lagerpeteds doing Pterosaur Origins, or is there yeah. anything else? Yeah, I guess we've already moved on to like Poposaurids and then on to you know, <laughs> new versions of the Jurassic franchise. So I think we're pretty inevitably. Done with that. The next uh, thing was basically the topic of the episode where we talk about our nerdy origin stories. Um, oh, and we're going to make this a series. your one, Scott. Specifically mine, apparently, because yes. I'm, going, I'm going to be going first. There's a lot more to me than just this, for obvious reasons. And I'm going to keep it very short, because basically the Tiki Cosmonaut has landed. My own origins go back to being very young during the 1970s, being interested in uh, reruns of... Harryhausen films on television, science fiction shows like Space 1999, and later Star Wars and Star Trek mostly. But I also have vivid memories of Viewmaster reels featuring stereoscopic photos of Ray Harryhausen's dinosaur models oh, yes. from one of his productions. And because I was four, I would actually poke the film out of the reels to see how the mechanism worked. Ah. Apart from breaking some of my favorite Viewmasters, I don't recall if I learned anything from the exercise. All I wound up with was some bits of film, and that's about it. 
But those reels specifically helped me put me on an uneven track towards being interested in paleontology in general and art specifically. I grew up reading a lot of fantasy and science fiction, especially when I hit my teenage years, which were also filled with tabletop role-playing games, choose-your-own-adventure style game books, and writing pulp-style fantasy stories. After college, I pursued art as a hobby for a long time before doing shows with other artists and making a few sales. I separated work into long-term projects, some of which, like the Tiki Cosmonaut, were formed around related sets of ideas, like, for instance, cultures associated with Tikis came from extraordinary navigators and explorers, and that the Cosmonaut designation both called attention to this as well as introducing it to a cosmic level. So the handle came out of that, specifically a painting I did and lots and lots of drawings of 60s googie architecture dynamic signage and graphic design, and of course, lots of tikis and fantasy spacecraft. I also wanted to distance it from the concept of ancient astronauts, since my tiki cosmonaut has terrestrial origins, and ancient astronauts as a concept is sort of asinine. So that's the origin of that handle I've been using for a while, originally made in service to an art project I have yet to return to. <laughs> Getting back to the science, though... I've always been a spectator, occasionally getting involved as a docent for our local natural history museum in Anchorage, where I met others, including Zach, and then later my wife, who worked on preparing a one-to-one -one scale model of a Tyrannosaurus skull for display. The art shows I've participated in have always had a scientific bent, again, mostly from the perspective of a spectator. And that's basically where I'm continuing from. You know, that's, those are my origins, and I stretch out pretty much from there some great origins i like it okay cool well you you would say that because you you are my wife and you, you're well, i course. mentioned you specifically in it so <laughs> well, you, you know that ancient aliens helped build the pyramids right i mean yes um, sure they did because nobody uh <laughs> not white could come up with surveying <laughs> there's like right. so much yeah, this whole ancient astronaut thing, there was like so much kind of uh, unchecked. Um, oh, yeah. Racism it, <laughs> involved oh, in the whole narrative. And racism is definitely the word for it because it's like oh, oh, brown people can't do these things. Clearly, they right. had help from ancient astronauts. But you never hear about Stonehenge being built by aliens. I mean, I, at least I don't, you know. Oh, I've heard there are I've some heard many times. But also, oh, let's, really? let's be clear. Stonehenge is just a bunch of blocks put on one end. It's not uh, not quite as impressive as building a giant pyramid. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Or a giant stone person. Or a giant or, stone person. Or a person who happens to be made out of uh, abstract ideas and concepts who doesn't necessarily look exactly realistically like a person, but exactly. has exaggerated features and, and all that as a Weird. part of a style, you know, like these like the Moai you see on, on Easter Island. It's oh, like, yeah. That was a thing in the 70s. It's like ancient astronauts build these statues. Why would they build statues? Let's <laughs> think about that for just a second. What are they trying to say to us? People who will kind of take these statues and things like that and go, oh, look, these are like ancient aliens as opposed to like, well, these are like, you know, people in the past made things up. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm just... I'm just thinking that, like, of all the artwork that I do, in like, if they survive and hundreds of years from now, people come across, like, my speculative evolution, you know, beasties or my monster girls, and they go, oh, look at these things that lived in the past. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a record of, of things. It's like a, a galaxy quest. Um <laughs> You know, but there are some 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 of them like you know you you do have aboriginals that talk about the dream time and creatures that live there. And those are obviously you know based on actual things that lived and uh, certain Native American uh, lore is the same too. You know, I guess yeah. as with everything else, you have to take these things in context, and context yeah. is like important for everything. Absolutely. Well, now you guys you guys know that Moe statues are their versions of like civil war heroes statues no i'm kidding <laughs> yeah obviously yeah, right yeah no you can't say things like that zach on a public podcast because somebody is going to take you Somebody's serious. gonna take it seriously yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me cut that, <laughs> cut that yeah. out darn good thing that we have the power of editing it's okay assuming yeah, people yeah. are not <laughs> assuming people yeah. are not dumb enough to take that seriously but i should know better by now
Yeah, we'll, we'll, edit, we'll edit out all the stuff where it hasn't been made entirely clear that it's like, we are making fun of this. We are not saying this and that, so. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Maybe the part about like the ancient as maybe the pyramid thing because I I bet you someone like some conspiracy theorists out there would just take that clip of you saying like oh as we know you know that aliens built the pyramids and then they'll just take that clip out of context. And... I have a question for you about your origin. You said that you you are a observer of of the science of it, but have you considered getting more involved in the science in any any way? I have, but uh, most of those attempts have been for me to go through like, and see, I don't have a degree of any kind at all, yeah. not even an art degree. I don't either, but I want to point out I was asked to speak at a scientific conference, so. And I, I gave a presentation at an online paleo conference. I mean, it doesn't take a degree. That is, that is probably true, but uh, that's that's all I've done in the past is like try to get that degree, try to go back and and, and get involved in from an academic sen uh, 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 sense standpoint. Yeah. But uh, you know, apart from the docenting, which is uh, at least being involved with public education, yeah, in a very sort of transitional way. I mean, it's it's very superficial docenting, I think, because people are there to show up, they're there to be wowed more than actually educated. But yeah. I still think it's really important that people do things like that for obvious reasons, because you know, every so often, it, it you get somebody who comes in and says, "Oh, is that a dinosaur?" and they point at a moose skeleton, and you're like, right. you back them off from that and say, "No, that's that's not a dinosaur, and this is why it's not a dinosaur." Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, become more involved i've just learned like i feel like i've been pulled in so many different directions and it's yeah. hard to focus on 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 one particular thing but if somebody asked me to uh talk at a conference or something like that i imagine i could probably come up with something to talk about for sure yeah it might not be my area of expertise or maybe it would be actually maybe i would talk about like putting christmas lights on dinosaur skeletons and making it into a series we're talking or, about bioluminescence as well, or yeah. Bioluminescent uh, uh, bones in 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 chameleons, you know, where oh yeah, you know, give them UV, a little bit of UV light and their skeletons pop. Yeah, I've thought about it a lot, and I just don't know where to go from from where I'm at currently at. Anyway, maybe something will occur to me. I think a lot of the uh, the things I struggle with right now are are art related, so I think that's the the avenue I would probably pursue if I were to get more directly involved in the science somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So angle, angle it more towards your art. I think that's a good idea. Oh yeah. Or I become more of a participant in the uh, paleo art group, which I'm doing right now. I'm actually, like I said, at the very beginning of the podcast, the most current iteration of the Electro Tiki series that I do, a link to which will be in the show notes um, is my first mammal of the series and i'm actually going to finish that this month you know it just needs a, a few things it's going to be some fishes involved and stuff like that but uh, you know i have a lot of uh balls in the air as far as that goes you know juggling all these different projects trying to uh focus on on one particular thing and a lot of that has to do with uh basically being involved with grief and not wanting to lose myself so i wanted to go back to my uh like i said in my origins here i used to do a lot of stuff with tabletop role-playing games and stuff like that and now i've got a site for that basically kind of a proto social media site but without the algorithms you know yeah uh, more of an abstract forum than anything else but uh uh that's one of the things that's actually helped me out uh, with with regards to that focus because it gives me something to do yes i think my next piece of art will be more directly related to dinosaurs because i have not done any theropod dinosaurs yet instead of picking something fairly obscure which is my usual modus operandi ever since the first one because triceratops is not obscure not a bit but all the ones i've done subsequently seem to be fairly obscure animals like cetacosaurus sibiricus obscure I think yeah. Guidraco, that's an obscure pterosaur. Even, even amongst pterosaurs, I would say that's fairly obscure. Yeah. But it captured my imagination at the time. So I had to do that. I had to do a painting around, uh, based around it. The next one should probably be a tyrannosaur of some sort. So we'll see. Heliorama. 
Or I could do Aliorabis, yeah. That's a Tyrannosaur. It is a Tyrannosaur. And, you know, I think people are, you know, people who are sort of lay people, they're just going to look at that and say, oh, well, it's a it's it's a T-Rex, you know, which is fine, really. I mean, I, I'm not going to pop up out of the bushes and say, well, you know, actually, <laughs> it's Aliorabis, which is a Tyrannosaurid. <laughs> Even though I can totally see myself doing that now. <laughs> yes, rising up out of the bushes, just, just like, like in a video game or something. Or like Homer Simpson just sort of emerging. From the bushes. And yeah. then walking backwards back into them. <laughs> After I've docented, I'm ready to go back into the foliage. What made you ask me about uh, helping out with the, with the dinosaur at first? Because that's basically how we yeah. met. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that uh, myself when we do my origin story. Okay, so what basically uh, made me want to ask you to help with the dinosaur is that we needed the help with the dinosaur <laughs> because it was huge. God? It's one-to-one -one scale, so it's like five feet in length. So, so of course you would ask me. It's like, hey, yeah. you're, a, you're a body. You're a person <laughs> that knows stuff. You're a sucker. Come on down. Oh Devote God, your you time and energy to this project I'm working on. And I did so willingly. Yes, you seemed like to really get into it, which honestly at the time surprised me, but now totally would not surprise me because, you know, it's totally your thing. Yes, so. that is totally my thing. Now there's a plaque at that museum underneath the skull with all our names on it. Oh, well, That's there is. True. Very cool. I lied. Oh. oh. Uh, again, you can't say things like that in a public <laughs> podcast, so somebody will take you seriously like I yeah, just did. No, we're going to have to say. edit that out now. <laughs> the, yeah. the rule of like public broadcasting is when, you're, when you are sarcastic, you have to make it really clear that you're Good point. sarcastic. Okay. Because <laughs> people believe anything these days, honestly. Yeah. yeah. But we got receipts. I mean, I got photographs that are still floating around from that process, you know, and not to put fine point on it, we're in them, you know, so. Maybe you oh. should put some of those into the video when it finally get done. Oh, sure. That's not bad. I think yeah. Because yeah. I don't think they've been shared on social media anywhere else. So, I don't think I've ever yeah. seen them. Yeah, I'll I definitely try to dig those out and uh, make sure they're available. I think I shared one of me like ages ago on Facebook on my old account. Oh, okay. I see. But you I can barely it tell it to me. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is where the skull broke Zach. It's because of the foam <laughs> incident. We'll talk about the foam incident at yeah. some point. Yeah, maybe maybe for a different podcast, really, because yep. the foam. The we'll have foam. a shot ready for the foam episode. All right. Well, if that's it, uh, it was a good podcast, and I uh, think we'll go ahead and sign off. You wanna, you wanna uh, uh, show us out there, uh, Tommy, and lead us out on a high note. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this particular episode. I'll ca we'll catch you guys in the next one. See ya.